Uh, thank you, Barack. It's a pleasure to be here, my first time. I didn't realize that I'd be competing with Jim Peebles for attention this morning, <laughs> but um, thank you. Uh, that was great news. All right, so I'm going to, within this talk, I'm going to have sort of three phases of the talk. The first few minutes, I'm going to do some very basic things. So for those of you who are very familiar with this, you can just sit back, take a little bit of a nap, and then come back about 10 minutes in. The second part of the talk is going to focus on what we learned from the first two observing runs of Advanced LIGO and Advanced Virgo. And then I'm going to tell you about what's been happening in the last six months and finish with just a, a little bit of a hint about where we're going for the next decade. So a reminder to everyone about gravitational waves. This is our space-time interval as usual. We've got our Minkowski metric sitting there with a perturbation that's small. We plug that into Einstein's equations, linearize, do a few tricks with coordinates, and we end up with a wave equation where this is the standard Minkowski wave equation um, for the metric perturbation. Forget about the bar on this, it's not too important, with the stress energy tensor on the right hand side. The important thing of this wave equation is if we take a look at it and ask about what the properties are of gravitational waves in vacuum, we can figure out a few different things. We can show that there are two polarizations. We immediately get that they travel at the speed of light. We also then know that they're transverse and they're traceless. Okay. So all of those pieces come directly out of that uh, field equation at the beginning with the stress energy equal to zero. If you keep the stress energy in and then go for a weak field approximation, you can then get to a form where you have a solution for the, um, the spatial pieces because the time-space time pieces are zero for this particular perturbation in this form. You can see here that the strength of the gravitational wave or the perturbation goes as one over the distance to the source. That's the R in here. You've got the second time derivative of the quadrupole moment of the source. And so it's related to acceleration of the quadrupole moment. If you want to then sort of have an order of magnitude estimate of the strength of the waves, you can convert things into this form on the right-hand side where you've got a mass, you've got a velocity related to, to the quadrupole moment, and you've got a, a distance to the source. And in particular, let's see if we can get this working. Um, this mass is what you can think of as the mass of the quadrupole variation, so the piece that is time-dependent. And the velocity is also the velocity of that time-dependent perturbation. So what you want to know is how much um, mass is in the quadrupole in order to know about the strength. You need to make it go fast. You've got a v squared there and you've got a c to the 4 on the bottom, so you know it's going to be get, you want to get it close to the speed of light. And of course, the r, if you look out in the universe, you don't have much control out of how far the things are away. They just are where they are. So if we take this and then uh, go to the next piece, which is what's the physical effect of the waves, I want to visualize this and I want to tell you a little bit about how uh, physicists came to terms with understanding that gravitational waves and their effects are real. So we're going to imagine this ring of particles floating out in space. There's going to be a reference particle in the middle, this red dot here. You've got a ring of particles around. They're floating in empty flat space initially. The, they're set up with a distance L from the center reference point out to each point on the circle. And this is what I'm going to call the, uh, s the, the spatial separation vector. So this just tells you what direction to go from the uh, central, central point. Now, in general relativity, there all of these um, particles follow uh, geodesics. And in particular, if we think about the central one as the reference, we can take that as one of the geodesics. And then we can ask about when a gravitational wave passes, what happens to the geodesics that are followed by the other particles going around. And the geodesic deviation equation is this here. It tells us that the second time derivative, proper time derivative, of the separation vector is dependent on the curvature tensor, inner, inner product with two uh, four velocities of the central particle here, and then project it onto the uh, separation. So if you take now the linearized equations, plug them into this, simplify again, you get a nice solution for what happens. You find out that the components for this ring, if you have a gravitational wave that is coming from the back of the room straight through the plane of the board, and you only have one of the polarizations present, the one we call plus, 
then what it does is it sets up a motion like this, where if you've got time dependence in the term H plus, which corresponds to the wave feature, it sets up a vibration. I keep doing that the wrong way. Uh, like so, so that you get stretching and squeezing in alternate directions. And in particular, then, the strength of the waves, when we reference it to this, we document it as the strain, which is given by this delta L divided by the original length. So this is then the basis of the detector that was first proposed by Ray Weiss back in 1972. He said, well, we've got these newfangled things called lasers, so let's do some fun stuff with them. Let's create a reference point here in the middle, which is a beam splitter. This corresponds to the red dot. You've got two mirrors that are suspended out along perpendicular directions in this particular instrument. They correspond to two of the yellow dots. You've got a photo detector down here, and you've got a laser beam here. And so what happens then is we uh, shine the laser onto the beam splitter. It bounces back off the uh, end masses. When a gravitational wave passes, it causes the interference pattern at the photodiode to change. So this is the basic principle that um, was studied by Weiss back in 72. And he actually wrote a design document where he tried to assess the different noise sources that would be present in such a detector. And that, that document really served as the roadmap to getting from uh, that initial conception through to the first uh, large scale gravitational wave detectors. So I'm going to tell you a little more about the design of the detectors as they exist today. Again, it's, it, I'm going to skim over this piece and get to the black holes and neutron stars in a minute. Um, this is a schematic of the detector. Again, you've got the laser source over here. It's producing about 180 watts of input power at, at, when it's at a maximum. Um, ignore this for the moment. Uh, you've got a beam splitter, which splits the light beam down two different directions. The end masses are down here, um, and they're at four kilometers distance in the laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory. But within this system, you also create resonant cavities. So you put a second uh, test mass near the center beam splitter here, and you set up these two arms such that they're on resonance. And that's done so that you can build up the circulating power inside of these arms by many orders of magnitude. And in particular, the target sensitivity for the full design of the LIGO, advanced LIGO detectors is around 700 kilowatts of circulating power inside of those arms. The test masses themselves are 40 kilograms at the ends, and they're suspended um, using few silica wires and on top of uh, active seismic isolation systems to actually vi remove vibrations from the system. There's a lot of other tricks that go into the design and implementation of these instruments. The signal recycling mirror here allows you to actually enhance your sensitivity by feeding back some of the laser light that comes back in this direction. And later on, you're going to just, I'll just mention what is one of the upcoming new uh, features, which is squeeze light going into the interferometers as well to target uh, to reduction in quantum light, uh, quantum noise. So, what, are, what is the current status of gravitational wave detectors at the moment? Well, this is the International Gravitational Wave Observatory Network. In the United States, we've got two detectors, LIGO Livingston, this one here, nice and lush and green. Uh, LIGO Hanford up here in the Northwest, uh, out in the desert on the, on the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. In Europe, the Virgo detector is a three kilometer instrument near uh, Pisa. GEO 600 is a 600 meter instrument. It's much less sensitive than the other three. Uh, nevertheless, we use it for prototyping and also to just provide coverage in case something happens while the others are offline. Finally, just last week, we signed an agreement with the uh, Japanese Kagura project, which is an underground detector uh, near the Kamioka mine in, uh, in Japan. And they have about three kilometer arms uh, they're targeting a fairly ambitious plan for the detector so that they will actually cryogenically cool the test masses to reduce the thermal noise. Um, and they're really hoping to get their first observing run happening by the end of this year. So they'll join us uh, in, in the observing campaign. Now, I wanted, this is, that was the whirlwind tour of you know, what is a gravitational wave, what is a gravitational wave detector, which ones we have. And I wanted to just pop up the motivation for gravitational wave detectors being built because 
This is a slide I used to use 10 years ago, uh, the motivation for why we were building the observatories. And we started out by you know, our little uh, blurb at the top, which was the baseline to test relativistic gravity and, to, and develop gravitational wave detection as an astronomical probe. And then we listed the various signals that we might uh, anticipate at the time. We had transient signals like compact binaries, supernova explosions, cosmic string kinks, black hole ring down. The green here and the underline indicates that we've actually measured those things. So those were two of the things we anticipated and we've got measurements of them. But as you can see, we're continuing down this list with a, a list of other things that are in, uh, in play that we hope at some point we will, we will find. Continuous signals from perhaps spinning isolated neutron stars. Stochastic signals from cosmological sources, whether they be distributed cosmologically or actually fundamental uh, uh, fluctuations from the Big Bang. Uh, serendipitous signals, this is sort of this all-seeing all category that we really don't know what's in there. It's not something we've managed to think of, like cosmic string cusps, but hopefully is something else that's out there that we will actually find and be able to say it's a gravitational wave, but then throw it out as a mystery to be understood and to be figured out. So the real key thing here is that we're only at the beginning of gravitational wave astronomy. It's, we've just um, scratched the surface and we've made the first early detections, but we've not um, gotten very far into it yet. Now coming back to the nature of the detectors and why we're actually limited to a particular range of observations, I wanted to introduce the, the noise that exists in the detectors and explain what it says about what the frequency of the gravitational waves is that we can detect. So I'm not going into any details on these. You can just make any list of things. You know, seismic is an obvious noise source for something like this. If you vibrate things, you're going to cause fluctuations in the signal. There is thermal motion of the mirrors and of, a, of other p in, p parts of the instrument. There's quantum noise, which is photon shot noise, but also radiation pressure noise. There's a whole bunch of technical noise sources associated with the control systems that we have to actually try and, and iron out over time. But when it comes down to it, the readout from a gravitational wave detector is hopefully operating in a linear mode where we have the noise plus any gravitational wave signal that is present inside of the readout. And then we uh, estimate the sensitivity, the target type of amplitude sensitivity in strain of the detector by considering the power spectral density, that's this Sn of f here, which is essentially take the Fourier transform of the noise only uh, and then take an average of uh, the amplitude squared of that. That gives you the following type of spectrum, one in which the frequency range starts off here at 10 hertz at the low end, going up to 100 here in the middle, and then up to a kilohertz and on up at the other side. On this noise budget, you can see a whole host of different things going on, but the lines that I want to draw your attention to first are this solid black line that goes down here like so and across. That is an estimate of all of the different pieces of the noise that, we are, that are fundamental within the advanced LIGO instrument. The actual measured noise in the second observing run is given by this light gray curve going across here. And you notice they're fairly similar at the upper end, but down the lower end there's a, a, a difference that isn't quite understood or explained by the list of fundamental sources that are already in play. Now, every time we go to do an upgrade to the instrument, we go through a cycle whereby we estimate each one of these fundamental noise sources. We then put together a noise envelope and um, with the new design of the instrument, and that sets the target for any upgrade that we might actually be trying to make. Eventually, we get our first measured noise curve, and then we have to commission, commission, commission to actually get down. But the important things on this that I really want to emphasize is you notice lowest frequencies, so, so any, actually, pardon me, let me say it, say it differently. Anything underneath the solid black line would be buried inside of the noise. So any gravitational wave signal that is underneath that line would be buried under the noise. 
That means that at low frequencies, below around 10 hertz, we actually have very poor sensitivity to gravitational waves. In what we call the bucket here, around 100 hertz and, and for several hundred hertz across, we have our maximum sensitivity to gravitational waves. And then in the upper end, we lose sensitivity due to photon shot noise. And um, so our, we're sensitive to gravitational waves that, gener that are generated with frequencies in this 100 hertz or so uh, range. So when we look for things, that's what we need to find. And that frequency range sets what's interesting to us in terms of, for example, binary black hole mergers and also binary neutron star mergers. Those signals, as we'll say, see in a moment, sweep through the gravitational wave frequency band all the way up to kilohertz for the lowest mass objects. But as the mass increases, the highest frequency present in the gravitational wave goes down. And so you can only see up to some maximum mass. So we're typically in the stellar mass range for, for binaries when we actually go to observe them. So what about the observing runs that we've done so far? This is, these are the observing runs that are with the upgraded advanced detectors. We began our first observing run in 2015, and most of you are aware of, of the first detection that came right before that, as, as is often the case with nature. Nature um, put that gave that to us during our engineering phase, which was sort of a good surprise for us. But it did set, it set the theme for that run, which was fantastic. The other dates you see in here are the second observing run, 02. And you notice that that was down here in 2017-ish. And then 03, which is the one that I'm going to focus on in the, at the end of the talk, is from around 2019 to 2020. The one other thing to notice in this is that there is a distance associated with each of the detectors during each of the runs. And this distance is what we call the binary neutron star range. So if you take it and you just calculate the volume of a sphere with that radius, that tells you the volume that we can actually probe with the detectors for binary neutron stars producing an SNR8 uh, candidate. And you notice that as we go along, we increase the sensitivity. So for, for O2, we were at about 100 megaparsecs. O3, uh, in the 105 to 130 megaparsecs, we'll say more about where we are. Heading to O4, where we get up to nearly 200. And then this here is the next big upgrade for us in the middle of the next decade, known as A+. And as you can tell, it goes of order doubling from what we call O4. Of course, we haven't reached O4, so we don't know we're going to get there yet. All right, so now let's go back to binary systems. And again, for people who don't think about it every day, I thought it would be worthwhile to throw up a couple of the parameters that, we, that these systems depend on. In this particular situation, I'm imagining that we have two-point masses in a Newtonian orbit. So you can actually do the whole calculation all the way through yourself relatively easily. We've got uh, two masses, M1 and M2, two separations, R1 and R2. Total mass, sum of the two of them. The reduced mass is given by this formula, product of m1, m2 divided by the total. The orbital frequency is going to be given by this omega here. So this is just Kepler's law. And then the separation A. And finally, the one thing I want to just highlight here is this V. This is the velocity. So that's just the orbital velocity. And it shows up in multiple places as we go through. So I just wanted to highlight it. When you solve those equations on uh, that really is just the equation on my first slide, you can go right the way through and you can find that h plus looks like this, h cross looks like this. You notice the 1 over r term. That's totally fine. You've got cosine of twice the uh, orbital frequency. So the gravitational wave frequency is dominated by the second, by twice the orbital frequency. And similarly over here, actually there's a sign. That should be a sign on one of those. Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, you've also got something that depends on the mass. It's the reduced mass that shows up top here. And then you've got the frequency squared. So the higher the frequency or the closer the separation of these things, the stronger the waves. So two things you want. You want to have big masses, make a bigger reduced mass. And then second, you want to have um, things moving quickly. So you want to have them close together. Black holes are ideal for this because their size is so compact, you can actually get them extremely close. Neutron stars aren't too bad. 
The next piece of this is then to ask the question of what happens when the gravitational waves are emitted. And you can quickly calculate the gravitational wave luminosity. It's given by this formula here. It depends on the third time derivative of the quadrupole moment squared. You get a term over here with a v over c to the power of 10. So it goes up rather quickly with, uh, as, as the speed approaches the speed of light. You can then plug in to, with the energy for the binary, do an energy balance calculation. And you can then get an evolution function for the velocity of the, of the orbit on the binary. So what happens as the gravitational wave is emitted, the orbit shrinks, and the, or, and the elements speed up. The last thing you can do here, which is kind of nice to do, is since you've got this increase in the velocity, which you know is connected to the decrease in separation, you do a quick calculation that tells you what the time is to coalescence. And the nice thing is that if you plug in some numbers from uh, known neutron star binaries in our galaxy, you can quickly see that some of them will merge within the age of the universe due to the emission of gravitational waves. So to just finish, this is, um, this is a, a sample uh, numerical relativity simulation for a pair of black holes. The parameters of this system actually correspond to the second event that we identified. It was on the 26th of December uh, 2015. And what you'll see here is a trace of the uh, strain imposed on the detector. So it goes across here like so. And when the two objects merge, it cuts off. You also notice a trace of the frequency as a function of the time. And as it goes across, it sweeps upwards uh, towards higher frequencies. This is a classic chirping signal, the one that we all uh, know and love now. So the simulation, uh, it'll last a few minutes, but you'll see the waveform tracing out. You see the frequency evolving. And so this is the type of thing that we've now detected that we had hoped to detect before 2015. This simulation was actually done by the SXS collaboration. But as we all know, Franz has also done simulations like that in the past. Um, so so let's, let's now just uh, sort of think about what we can do with our gravitational wave data. And the answer to this comes by um, doing a more detailed calculation of the waveform and checking what uh, the dependence of the waveform at the detector is like. What you find is that the signal depends on, there's a sort of a reference time which sets where the, well, we normally think of it as the coalescence time, but basically sets where some frequency is achieved. The waveform at the detector also depends on the right ascension and declination to the source the polarization angle of the source, and then a set of internal parameters, which are things like the luminosity distance. So this is the observer. This is the obser observer or detector down here. We've got the luminosity distance out to the source. You've got two objects going around each other. So you've got masses. You've got each of the independent spins. You've also got an inclination angle, which if you, if you have a non-spinning system, that inclination angle is just uh, the inner product between the orbital angular momentum and the line of sight. When you're spinning, you get precession, and you have to do a slightly different approximation to kind of get a, a, better, um, a better situation. Nevertheless, the bottom line is that there are 17 parameters in total. And so the question is, how many can you measure? It's pretty obvious that since we're measuring the strain, in principle, you can start to get at things like the distance. But the trouble with that is that the amplitude term depends on the masses. But the nice thing is that the phase terms inside of this h plus and h cross don't depend on the distance, but do depend on the masses. And they're dominated by the terms that depend on the masses. So you can measure the masses well from the phase. You can plug that into the amplitude. And by measuring the amplitude, you can measure the distance. And so you can start to see how you peel out different pieces of information. Of course, the analysis is more sophisticated than that, as the team here knows. Um, but, but this is the basic principle. So I'm going to change gears now and tell you about the results that were put out uh, last December by the uh, LIGO-Virgo collaboration. These are the results that came in what we call the first gravitational wave transient catalog. Um, 
and the, I'm, I'll say a little more about what's happened since then uh, with, uh, with other groups in a moment. But within this catalog, we had identified 11 events with a false alarm rate less than uh, one, per one, one per 30 days and with a greater than 50% chance of being astrophysical. So this was the set that, that show up in the, calcul in, the, in the catalog that we kind of trust in our, from our analysis. There were 10 binary black hole mergers, and we'll talk about the masses of those and, and various other properties in a moment. And there was the one famous binary neutron star. In addition to that, we had 14 marginal candidates. The uh, chance of being astrophysical was less than 50% by our estimations. And so we put them in the catalog, but for us, they, they didn't make it into our pure sample that we were actually interested in. When you look at these, this is a, a, a technical plot in which the strength or the significance of the, of the gravitational wave signal in the data is shown along the horizontal axis. This is a, a likelihood in this particular plot. Um, and along the vertical axis here is the number of events above a given threshold where you think where any one of these can be considered a threshold above which you count candidates. The blue line here with the dashed black one over it corresponds to our estimate of the background in the search that is done here. And so things that if there was no signal in the data, when you would histogram up the, the results, what you would expect is that the black line, which is over this here, would come down and basically stay very close to this all the way down to uh, one event. Instead, of course, we have uh, this set of signals starting out here with the uh, most significant thing we've detected in that catalog being the 17th of August uh, 2017, which is the BNS. The second most significant was the first detection. And then you work your way backwards and you start to go through all of the 11 candidates getting down to here, after which you can more or less see that you've got this transition to something that looks like it's growing very steeply uh, with the noise. So this noise model here is the thing we compare to because we consider, well, actually, I should be a little careful. There's two, there's kind of two, two noise models buried here. There's one for the first run and one for the second one. They differ slightly. But, uh, but they're for the whole run, though. So when we present our results, it's based on each of those runs exactly. So, so this is, this is the, the sort of the data coming out here of what we, what we see. And these are the 11 things we identified as, as candidates that we think are significant. Other things have to lie right in here in this little tiny region, because that's the region where the signal model, which is this line down here, compared to the noise model, transitions. Okay? So that's how deep we can go. Now, the really fun part of uh, where we are is that we're no longer uh, overly secretive he says. <laughs> um, but uh, we're no longer overly secretive, but we, and we do now release our strain data to allow others to use it. We've made two large-scale bulk releases of our data so far. The O1 strain data was released in 2018, and the O2 strain data was released in 2019. Um, you can find, if you happen to be interested and didn't know where it is, this data along with uh, information about the events we've found is at this gwopenscience.org uh, uh, website. Um, but I wanted to draw attention to this work, especially since it's actually based from the IAS group. Um, the uh, IAS group has been working on analyzing this data since the O1 data went public. And they uh, recently put out uh, this nice paper on a new set of black holes. The analysis methodology is quite different than the one used by the LIGO Virgo teams, which is great. Um, I refer to this as, I know I'm going to get in trouble when someone sees the recording. Uh, I refer to this as the, as the first credible analysis of the bulk data by a team that wasn't at some point part of the LIGO collaboration. So it's actually um, quite a, a, uh, um, a, a good, uh, a, an excellent piece of work. The, the candidates um, are interesting. 
the, the, the false alarm rates are reported here in terms of units of the duration of O2. And it's one over the false alarm rate that's reported. So the bigger the number, the more significant these are in the search. They, these are in addition to the candidates found by LIGO Virgo. And they, they, the, the group reports a P astro over here on the right hand side. And this is only their list of candidates that satisfy the P astro, the, the probability that they're astrophysical of being greater than 0.5. So this is interesting. It essentially doubles the number of binary black holes detected during the second observing run. Um, and uh, it shows that there are alternate approaches that may give us interesting candidates. These are all similar to the binary black holes found by LIGO Virgo. Um, so, so this is, in some sense, narrowing in on the region where we know there are signals. It's not the attack that uh, LIGO Virgo take. We tend to do the eyes wide open and go after everything at the same time. We don't want to miss anything uh, when, we, when we do that initially. So if you put those objects on your, on your previous signals, they're all riding that, in that same so, so that's actually part of the reason I'm here is for us to learn from each other and actually understand these. That's not quite true with this plot because the search is different. And so the noise model is actually different. And so when you, if in this one, we've got everything covering all the masses down to one solar mass, for example. The search that's reported in this in by, by, the, by uh, um, the IAS group is actually uh, only focused on the higher masses so far. So the model is slightly different. Um, clearly, in ours, they have to be somewhere in here. But they could actually be deeper because the noise model might not be growing as steeply in the case that of the analysis that they're doing. All right, so what do we know about the masses? Well, the, uh, in, it's interesting. The, um, the mass of the first binary black hole that we measured was somewhere up around you know, 39, 29 kind of solar masses, so it was in here. This is a mass, mass plot. The, this is the uh, primary component. This is the secondary. We, we tend to cut off the upper side just because of the symmetry. Each one of these curves corresponds to a 90% Bayesian posterior uh, weight. And so this is our estimate of where the masses lie. And so what you can see is for all of these systems, they butt up against the equal mass line. There are some very high mass objects going up into the region of 40 and 50 or so solar masses. And as you work back down, you get down to here, this nice region, which is around 10, 10. Um, and then you skip right down here. And this thing is the binary neutron star. So absolutely buried by the others right now. The shape of this curve is worth mentioning. This is a line of what's called constant chirp mass. It is the combination of the mass parameters that controls the dominant rate of change of frequency for the binary system. And as you're lower and lower in the mass, you actually get to measure it much better. So you can see that you've got this narrowing uh, of these little bananas, and the shape is very characteristic. If we take a look at where this, uh, these events uh, appear relative to what we knew before LIGO started measuring these gravitational waves, on this, diagram, this plot, the horizontal really has no meaning. The vertical it shows the masses of various uh, compact objects. The purple here are um, black holes that were, had masses that were estimated through pure electromagnetic observations. And the range is from five solar masses up to around 20 at the maximum. Each of these triple points here corresponds to a merger. You've got two black holes that collide to form a third. And so what you can see is that even in the initial elements, we were, sen we're sensing black holes that are more massive than any we've seen in the galaxy so far using electromagnetic measurements. And we're generating uh, a set of black holes that are higher still. So one of the interesting things that we've, we actually have to try and understand and unravel as time passes is how do these binaries form and whether or not, for example, you can get secondary formation of one of these merged objects with some other, other object and therefore build up um, to much more massive black holes as time goes by.
The other thing that's shown on this is the, uh, a number of uh, known neutron star masses, again, between 1 and 2, typically slightly above 2. Of course, there's an even more massive uh, neutron star that was announced recently that uh, doesn't show up on this graph. And the LIGO-Virgo uh, neutron star binary, the individual masses were sitting here right in the middle kind of area where we, where, you would ex where we would expect them to be. And of course, it forms some object that we don't really know anything about at the present time. Okay. So I'm going to um, now tell you a little bit about the spins of the various objects. This is what we call a violin plot of the spin, chi effective. It's, a ba it's this combination of the masses and the spins projected onto the orbital angular momentum divided by the mass. And it's a number between 0 and 1 for every binary system. The violin notion here is that these are basically showing you the posterior weight on the plot. And so what you see is, for most of them, the uh, dominant weight is close to 0. This particular one here, um, 0729, the, we have some weight in the positive chi effective. Um, but again, it's just it's one case, and, and we're not exactly sure of the details of this. Knowing the spins is important for distinguishing formation channels of the binaries. So it will allow us, if we can actually get spins of certain kinds to argue that the populations that we're seeing either come from things like globular clusters or come from field binaries within uh, more standard galaxies. The rates are, um, okay, sorry, get back to my, there we go. Um, the rates for these objects are interesting. We've calculated what they, what they appear to be. These are the posteriors over the rates. This is actually the rate multiplied by P of R. And um, there are two different curves that are important. This blue curve represents when we've got a, a flat in log R prior. This is when we've got a power law prior. I kind of don't worry about the differences in these at the moment. We don't really know what's the right answer. The bottom line is the peaks sit in here in this range, somewhere from around 20 up to around 70 or so. And if you take a look at that, at the, at the highest end, this tells you that there's one merger or so every few minutes somewhere in the universe. It's kind of a nice little uh, uh, um, anecdote. Now, because I just can't uh, resist this one. I'm going to say a little bit about the binary neutron star before I change gears to 03. So the binary neutron star came on the 17th of August 2017. Uh, it was an interesting situation, even in the sense of the detection. When we first measured it, it was only seen in a single instrument, with at that time we were not putting out to our partners automatically. So we had to go in and we had to clean up our data stream. When I, when I play this here, on the bottom line, on the bottom graph, it shows you the um, evolution of frequency and time. <laughs> and that ping, as you all know, is the sound of a gamma ray burst. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. So, so, you know, this was beautiful. We, when we got to our database, um, we already had the candidate sitting in there. We have an analysis that automatically takes any candidate and seeks out whether there is an electromagnetic counterpart from gamma ray telescopes or other things that have been announced. So we had found the association. And so within, I would say, minutes, we already had this association between what was a very clear neutron star, neutron star merger track and a gamma ray burst. And so this was a particularly exciting time. The information that started to come from the gravitational waves only takes us and allows us to actually measure the masses of the neutron stars involved in this. The blue represents a restrictive uh, spin prior. The red shows you a much broader spin prior. When you look at this, let's focus on the blue one. What you notice is this is, again, that chirp mass line with a very narrow, because we measure very precisely the chirp mass when we've got low masses, and the typical mass somewhere around 1.3 and 1.4. So this is beautifully in the region you expect. The next phase of this um, was the follow-up by electromagnetic telescopes. I don't know who's seen this one before. Anyone? A few of you? A few of you have seen it? 
Yeah. So this one, uh, it's, it's really nice. This is an animation produced by the Growth Collaboration. It shows you basically the different telescopes when they got on sky to try and identify the event. The interesting thing, if you watch, it's about one second every 0.2 days. And you watch night creep across South Africa. Bam, the discovery is made. The next night, South Africa, an observation is made. Unfortunately, South Africa missed out. And so LCO missed out on the first detection because the sky map that we generated wasn't ready until about 10 hours after the, um, the, the detection. And so it was already the, the point on the places on the sky had already set in Africa. But it's wonderful to see all of the telescopes participating. This observation runs for, um, I think it runs for about 10 days. Um, but the main point is that telescopes all over the world in space across all wavelengths participated in the observation of this event. And in particular, the first discovery is, is already something kind of fascinating. So this What's is the one in Antarctica. The one in Antarctica is, is Ice Cube. So, um, yes. <laughs> I'm not going to take responsibility for this beautiful animation. But <laughs> um, so, sorry, I went the wrong direction there. Uh, so here is here's now the discovery image. Um, this was made by uh, the one meter, two hemisphere telescope collaboration using the Swope telescope in uh, South America. The galaxy you're looking at is NGC 4993. The arrow points to the transient that was observed on that first night. And the, uh, the, the, the finding of the transient was interesting. It immediately, actually, I'll just, I'll just um, blink the image. This is actually blinking an image from the first night and from four days later. But in essence, this discovery was made by blinking images of the other galaxies. So that's how they found the counterpart. But what I love is this. This is one of my favorite results, right? So um, the day before, uh, using various sort of local experiments, you, you kind of knew that the speed of gravity and the speed of light was about one part, the same to about one part in 10 to the 4. The next day, you knew it was the same to one part in 10 to the 15. The difference arises because of the 1.7 second delay between the merger and the gamma ray burst compared to how far away the galaxy is. Okay? And so you can do an estimate based on the gravitational waves alone, but having the galaxy just helps you to refine it and make it much tighter. And so, so I, I love that one. The, uh, what did this tell us about the neutron star rates? Well, if you take a look at these numbers and take a look again, it doesn't really matter what these plots are. The rate is along the horizontal. The probability is on the vertical. We did two different types of approaches to estimating the sensitivity and selection effects to try and understand what the rate is in the universe. And if you take a look, the peak is you know, somewhere around here at 1,000 per gigaparsec per year. I like that number as well, because that's about um, 1 million per megaparsec cubed per year. And the sort of original rate estimation paper by Sterl Finney from 1991, that was basically his guess. And so I love the fact that that number came in uh, more or less exactly that way. Now there's a, a lot of other things you can do with this candidate and also with the other events that I mentioned. But I just want to touch on one or two of them as we go. So this one here is, is the uh, effort to try to measure the size of the neutron star. This is done by looking for tidal distortion of the neutron stars as the merger progresses, because that causes the phasing of the gravitational wave signal to be altered a little bit. You can also use actually information from the merger itself. And also we even bring in electromagnetic information to try and refine that measurement. This is the pure GW one. So when you look at that, what we have is, again, the radius along here going from 8 up to 14. And along here, we have the mass of the neutron star. And so if you take a look, each of these correspond to one of the elements of the binary. You get these masses that are sitting in here in this 1.3, 1.4 range. And the radius is sitting in this area between sort of around sort of 10 up to uh, around uh, 12 or 13. The actual number that we had for the neutron star radius is about 11.9 kilometers plus or minus 1.4. So you did, you did measure that basically? Yes. Relative to the, the, uh, the, yeah. the Yep. This was an incredibly 
bright source. <laughs> Right. It is very nearby. So we didn't anticipate having, having such a thing, especially the first BNS. And so we, we got kind of lucky. Um, the other thing that you can do is measure the expansion of the universe. This is the uh, paper we put out again very soon after uh, the first uh, discovery of, the, of this BNS. The graph shows the, um, the Hubble constant along the horizontal axis. And again, the probability uh, along the vertical. The blue line is our, uh, our posterior. Okay? There's all sorts of subtleties to this. We've got local velocity corrections for the galaxy. We've got uh, problems depending on what the actual sort of mass shape is for the, for the population and other things. Nevertheless, you notice the peak sits in here beautifully between the supernova and Planck. So, um, <laughs> so all right. So. With, I, I'm going to run over time, it looks like, so I'm going to apologize and I'm just going to go faster. No, <laughs> I will skip several slides. Let me tell you now about uh, observing run three. Observing run three began on the 1st of April 2019. There are three detectors that were operating in it first. We broke it into two parts. O3A ended on the 30th of September uh, 2019. This graph shows time in weeks from the beginning of the run and then that range that I mentioned before. Each dot corresponds to a local in time measurement of the range of the interferometers. They actually do fluctuate a lot. It's, you've got to work hard to keep them very stable. But you can see that LIGO Livingston was reaching about 140 megaparsec and LIGO Hanford was slightly less stable but had got up as far as about 110 megaparsec and Virgo was coming in somewhere around 50 megaparsec. We've got six months of calendar data in the can. The duty cycle is pretty high. It's up above 70% for, for even the triples. So we're actually pretty happy with that. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting to take a look at is uh, this plot, which again, you've got the time in weeks along the horizontal. And up here, you've got the cumulat cumulative time volume in megaparsec cubed kilo years. And the, you can see, because Livingston is much more sensitive, it grows at a, steeper, at a steeper rate, the volume that's surveyed. The dashed line is our estimate of the sensitivity volume for the search we do. And at the end of O3A, we acquired about 1.5 times 10 to the 6 megaparsec cubed years. And so roughly speaking, you might anticipate a couple of binary neutron stars in the data. The other important aspect of of this run is that we switched completely to public alerts. We don't have partnerships for all of the electromagnetic follow-ups anymore. The time scale for release of events is that uh, is shown on this axis here. So this is 10 seconds, one minute, one hour, one week. And this is the early part where we, we make the detection and we go through a set of vetting, uh, automated vetting, and we relief release what we call a preliminary alert. This has a sky localization and a preliminary classification. Um, this, our target for it was to be sub-minutes. We're actually currently at about six minutes as a kind of typical release time. We're still, we're st we still have a ways to go with our, our sort of technological solution under the hood. The graph that's embedded there, here's a bigger version of it. This gives you a sense of how well we've done with getting our first answer out the door, and then having checked the data afterwards, we retract things where we know something was wrong with the instrument. The red corresponds to the retractions. So you can see we had a bad August. Uh, it was pretty unfortunate. Um, the dip here in the middle, that's one of those times where you really get tested as a physicist because when you look at, uh, at the rate of detections in that, you go plus on statistics, no problems. But the first of those came on the first of the month. The la second of them came at the end of the month. <laughs> and in that middle period, the gut starts to come into play rather than the head. So, uh, so, so the, um, the, the last, uh, the, the almost last slide that I want to show you today is a, an overview of what we saw so far in O3A. The, the graphic in the middle shows the mass mass plane for binary systems. It goes from one solar mass up to tens of solar masses here. We break the regions into classes. The binary neutron stars are anything that has masses measured masses below 3, 3. 
There's neutron star black holes here. There's a region which we refer to as the mass gap between three solar masses and five solar masses for any of the, either of the components. And then binary black holes are what we call things that have masses above five solar masses. We've got 20.5 binary black holes. Um, so these numbers here represent the sum of Piastro for each of the candidates. So what you see is there's a total of 33. That's base, how many candidates we, we put out. And so if you take a look, you know, we've got 3.75 terrestrial, so slightly more than 10% we flagged as, as terrestrial. Our target was something happened. something happened. And our target was 10%. Our tar target was that our purity would be 90%. So, so far, based on these initial preliminary numbers, things are looking good. We've got a number of interesting things. We've got 190525, which is a BNS. We've got, uh, this is just a typical binary black hole. I just pulled it out, uh, 190707Q. And this one here, uh, 190814BV, uh, we just last week, it, it's marked as an NSBH here, we just last week um, decided that we're going to write uh, what we call an exceptional event paper. So that'll come out as a separate paper about that candidate. Uh, time scale for that last one, well, time scale for this one here, is it is coming out as exceptional since it was just the second BNS. It'll come out sometime in the next month, I anticipate. Uh, this one here, uh, the 14th of August, that's going to take longer, probably not until the new year. So with that, I'm going to um, finish by just uh, saying just two words about uh, where we're going next. So you've already seen this graphic. It shows you all of the detectors around the world. The the most important ones are the two LIGO, the Virgo, and hopefully the Kagra one. There is a detector under construction now in LIGO India. They, uh, I, well, yeah, so it's under construction. They, they were still in the final stages of land acquisition. I'm hoping that they will actually be able to announce that that's finished fairly soon. Um, that is going to form the network of gravitational wave detectors that operate starting around the middle of the next decade. 2025 is the time scale to imagine that we actually have operational five gravitational wave detectors distributed around the world. The sensitivity of these detectors, you can take a look at here fo focused on the ones that have LIGO in the name. So this here again is actually the O2 sensitivity curve. And this line here is the advanced LIGO design sensitivity. So you can see we're still a bit of a factor away in O2. So we're still hoping to get there in what we call O4, which will happen uh, about from now, about two years from now, it will start. But then there's an upgrade, this thing called A+, uh, that was funded last year by the National Science Foundation. And that will, act, will uh, add a number of features to the current, in, current uh, sites to enhance the sensitivity by about a factor of two for binary neutron stars over the advanced LIGO design sensitivity. And with that, I'm going to stop. Thank you.